Untap your full potential with the untapped deck tracker. Both the in-game overlay and the personal stats provide a lot of value. Download it for free today using the link below and you'll be supporting the channel at the same time. Hello and welcome to another Standard Games video. Today we're hunting for bargains, playing a blue-black deck that's using some underappreciated cards and combos, and the main build-around card in the deck, as voted on by my supporters on Patreon, is a Demonic Bargain, a 3-mana rare sorcery from Crimson Vow that makes us exile the top 13 cards of our library, and then we can search our remaining library for any card and put it into our hand. So historically speaking, these 3 or 4 mana tutor effects, as they're called, aren't particularly powerful as they don't immediately impact the board. And then Demonic Bargain has the additional downside of exiling the top 13 cards, so there's always the chance that we exile the card we actually wanted to search up. But it can also turn into an advantage when combined with Serpentine Curve. The 4 mana sorcery creates a 0 0 green and blue fractal creature token. Then we put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, where X is 1 plus the total number of instant and sorcery cards we own in both Exile and in our graveyard. So normally we would grow the Serpentine Curve by casting a bunch of instants and sorceries. But because it also counts the cards in exile, we can grow it thanks to Demonic Bargain. And in a deck with such a high instant and sorcery count as this one, we can often curve turn 3 Demonic Bargain, searching up a turn 4 Serpentine Curve, and then the token will often be a 10 10 if not larger, and then in the late game can get even bigger. So that's the main combo that our deck is capable of, and then of course we always have the flexibility of searching up any other card in our deck depending on the situation with Demonic Bargain. If we already have Serpentine Curve in hand but are missing a fourth land, we can also get a fourth land with Demonic Bargain, so there's a lot of flexibility there. And then some other neat combos in the deck involve Seagate Stormcaller, the 2-mana two 2-1 two Human Wizard, that when it enters a battlefield, lets us copy the next instant or sorcery spell with mana value 2 or less that we cast this turn. And there's no shortage of powerful 1- and 2-mana instants and sorceries. And one of them is Dreadfugue, a discard spell with Cleave that lets us take a look at the opponent's hand and then choose a non-land card from it with mana value 2 or less, and that player has to discard that card. But we can also cast it for its Cleave cost, in which case we can take any non-land card from the opponent's hand. And Dreadfugue still has mana value 1 even if we cast it for its Cleave cost, meaning that if we have 5 mana, we can play a Seagate Stormcaller and then play a Dreadfugue with Cleave and get to cast it twice essentially, taking away any 2 cards from the opponent's hand that aren't lands. So that's a pretty neat combo. Then taking a look at the rest of our deck, of course we're a Delver of Secrets deck, which can take advantage of all these instants and sorceries in the deck. We've got 38 instants and sorceries total, so we've got about a 2 in 3 chance of transforming Delver's Secrets in our upkeep and turn into a 3-2 flyer for 1 mana, which is quite powerful. Then we've got Consider as an instant to take a look at the top card of our library. We can put it into our graveyard if we want, and then we get to draw a card, so that's another way to grow Serpentine Curve. Fading Hope as a cheap bounce spell that also lets us cry 1 if the returned creature had mana value 3 or less. Blood Chief's Thirst can destroy a creature with mana value 2 or less, can also be kicked to take out larger creatures and even Planeswalkers, and if we have 6 mana total, we can play Stormcaller alongside a kicked Blood Chief's Thirst. Then we already discussed a Dreadfugue, then two copies of a Village Rites, which as an additional cost to cast requires us to sacrifice a creature, and then we get to draw two cards, so a great combo alongside Hunt for Specimens, generating a 1-1 pest token that gains a life when it dies, and also lets us learn. And then we can also combine Village Rites alongside Seagate Stormcaller, even if we don't have anything else to sacrifice, we can play Stormcaller, have one mana left over hopefully, to cast Village Rites, and then sacrifice Stormcaller itself to draw four cards cards, which is still a pretty good deal. And then Hunt for Specimens lets us learn for one of our seven sideboard lessons, including two copies of Environmental Sciences to find a basic land and gain two life, teachings to draw two cards if the opponent has more cards in hand than we do, two copies of Necrotic Fumes which we can combine with the token itself to exile a creature or planeswalker from the opponent, and finally a mascot exhibition which can also help close out the game. And then of course our Demonic Bargain plus Serpentine Curve combo. Then the mana base is pretty interesting, including 4 copies of Seagate Restoration, which is mainly here to count as a sorcery to make it more likely for us to transform Delver of Secrets, as well as growing the Serpentine Curve if we exile it with a Demonic Bargain. And then every now and then at 7 mana we can cast it to draw cards equal to the number of cards in our hand plus 1, and we don't have a maximum hand size for the rest of the game. It does come at a cost if we want to play it untapped, it's gonna cost us 3 life. 
And the same applies to Angadim's Awakening, which can potentially return some of our creatures from our graveyard to the battlefield. So it could get back a Delver of Secrets or maybe a Seagate Stormcaller. And then if we still have mana left over, we could even make use of the Seagate Stormcaller's ability. And then the rest of our mana base includes three basic islands, three basic swamps, which we also need for environmental sciences, and then four of the blue-black pathway, and four copies of Shipwreck Marsh. So that's our deck, now let's jump in some games and see how the deck does. Alright, we're on the play, and what do we think of this hand? Yeah, it's not the worst. We've got two lands, basically. We've got Demonic Bargain into Serpentine Curve. So Bargain could find a second curve or maybe a land if we're still missing one. Question is what to do on turn one. Probably just consider to try and find a land. And then if I find a Delver of Secrets, for instance, I could cast a turn two alongside a discard spell. Opponent on mono green, and we did see a Delver of Secrets. So that's hard to turn down, and I think I'm gonna keep it. And then make the play I described, but now we're really hoping to find another land. So let's have a look. And double Blizzard Brawl can take one. Play Delver. And then definitely fine to grab a land with Demonic Bargain. Alright, consider can find a land and transforms Delver, and then Thirst can kill the pack leader, so they don't get to fight with it. And Hunt for Specimens could eventually find a land, but it's probably too slow. So let's put that in the graveyard. Found another Delver. Not exactly what I was hoping for. Now we could, of course, using the Learn from Hunt for Specimens, also discard and draw from our hand to maybe get rid of the second Demonic Bargain, which would have been okay. All right, so we're gonna lose our Transform Delver to the Blizzard Brawl here, most likely. But Monogreen's gonna struggle to deal with a huge Serpentine Curve, so that's our hope. So I'll have to take quite a bit of damage here. Demonic Bargain for any black producing land will be fine. So if we have a shipwreck left, that'll do. And so Serpentine Curve, gonna be a 15-15, not bad. And then we can try to close out the game with our flying Delver of Secrets. With the Serpentine Curve holding the fort on the ground, potentially. Although, maybe we can get a second Serpentine Curve going so we can actually attack with it without dying on the way back. So we're down to 8. This needs to stabilize us. And one hit will kill the opponent. Now I did briefly consider adding maybe some enchantments to give the token flying to try and close out the game, like a Rune of Flight would have been useful, for instance. Very aggressive attack from the Mammoth. And we drew another Serpentine Curve, so that's a pretty excellent draw. So can I afford to attack? Our opponent could jump, enchant their lands, which can make an extra 4-4 token. So the answer is no. But we should be safe for a, a little bit here. And we can maybe attack with both Serpentine Curves now that they're both lethal. Although that still leaves the problem of the token they can generate, but I can Demonic Bargain for a Bounce Spell perhaps. Get uh, Fading Hope. So let's try that. Now I could still die to a Snakeskin Veil if that's their last card, but that's probably a risk I'm willing to take. So let's Demonic Bargain see if we actually have a Fading Hope left before I make this play. We do. So we'll grab Fading Hope. Attack with both. Opponent has to double jump. And then if they go to make their Troll Token, end of turn. Alright, never mind. Our opponent has given up. So they're probably not playing Ulvenwald Oddity, which also could have threatened lethal after we bounce one of their creatures. 
And uh, we could have also main phased the Fading Hope potentially to check for Snakeskin Veil, although that could still get us in trouble if the opponent can gain life at instant speed with like an Inscription of Abundance. So who knows, but uh, either way, on to the next one. Alright, we're on the draw. Not feeling great about this hand. Missing blue mana and a third land. But that being said, there's a lot of good draws. All our blue sources would be great. Then we could draw like a hunt for specimens to set up village rights. We do have a bit of early interaction with Blood Chief's Thirst so we don't get run over at least. So I'm still tempted to keep it. Could also draw a swamp as our third lands to bargain and then find blue mana to cast double curve. All right, there's my blue mana, so we'll get this out of the way. Up against mono white aggro is my assumption here. Ooh, Thalia is pretty annoying, but luckily we've got Thirst to deal with her. And the hope is they don't have a second copy. Elite Spellbinder could also mess us up a little bit. Yep. So if they're clever, they might go for Demonic Bargain here, which would then mess up the 3-4 sequence into Serpentine Curve. Our opponent could also be playing with Brutal Cathar, which is a great answer to the Serpentine Curve token. So not a card we want to see necessarily. Opponent exiles the Serpentine Curve. So yeah, I guess we'll cast Demonic Bargain. And then do I just get another Serpentine Curve? Could also go for like a Seagate Stormcaller to combo with Village Rites. But let's see what's left in our deck before we decide. Alright, so Serpentine Curve, only a 9-9, so not huge, but probably still worth taking here. And then the hope is that Village Rites will eventually draw us into some removal for the Flyer, or that we can outrace it with our big tokens. Sure. So, 10-10 Serpentine Curve. And another Spellbinder. Alright, at least we can cast one of them now. But two three-powered flyers can close out the game in a hurry. And we drew the last one, so... We'll see how this plays out. Funny that Serpentine Curve also grows the more cards the opponent exiles with the Spellbinder. So taking 6 here, and then our opponent doesn't know about the author Serpentine Curve yet, so they're probably going to take 11 if I attack, and then hope for the best here. And next turn I could technically play another huge Serpentine Curve, but that one's probably not going to matter. So your opponent gets in for 6, threatening lethal for next turn, and they've got another chum blocker. Alright, Delver of Secrets gives us something to work with. So I've got a couple options. I could play Delver of Secrets, sacrifice it to Village Rites, hope to draw two interactive spells, like a Blood Chief's Thirst and or Fading Hope which could get the job done. Alternatively, I can attack with both Fractals, opponent double chumps, and then I can sacrifice one of the tapped Fractals to Village Rites to try and find something, and then one interactive spell might be enough to keep me alive, but then we of course only have the one Fractal left to apply pressure with. So, tricky spots, but I think we're gonna start by attacking with both. Opponent's going to double chump. And then, yeah, I think I got a village rights. One of the fractals here. And then Delver can at least block the Sentinel. And then can maybe still get out of this. Demonic bargain and consider. That's not quite going to do it. 
because I can play Restoration, but then I'm at two, and one of the Spellbinders is lethal, even if I Demonic Bargain for an answer for one of them. So I guess I have to consider and hope to find an interactive spell instead. Stormcaller would have been awesome if I actually had the interaction already, which I don't, so that's not going to be good enough. Fading Hope, alright, that keeps me in the game. Assuming no additional interaction from our opponent, if they can enable Coven, we could also be dead, but they only have three powered creatures at the moment. Alright, Usher. So they've got blockers to prevent dying to the uh, Fractal here, especially after I'm forced to bounce Elite Spellbinder. So it's still not looking great. So, can block and then bounce. So this is a game we might have been able to win if our opponent had fewer flyers. Shipwreck Marsh, is that good enough? So our opponent's going to replay Spellbinder and have two blockers, basically. So a Demonic Bargain for one removal spell is not going to be enough. And of course, Demonic Bargain is going to cost five. Just playing a Serpentine Curve is also not going to cut it. So... Yeah, I don't think uh, land's going to be good enough. But I'm not sure what sequence of draws really saves me. Uh, Dread Fugue is certainly not what the doctor ordered here. So, yeah, I can um, Demonic Bargain for a removal spell for Usher or a removal spell for Elite Spellbinder, but opponent can jump and survive, and there's no way I can survive the attack on the way back here. So yeah, close game. Got lucky to draw all the Serpentine Curves, but just needed one additional interactive spell or have my opponents miss on uh, producing an extra blocker. So... I guess we'll go for Demonic Bargain, see what's left. And I guess this could also highlight the drawback of exiling the top 13 cards, as for instance there's no Bloodsheaf's Thirst left, which is a card I actually wanted to get. But yeah, let's say we would have been able to cast Fading Hope, that still doesn't really save us here. So, last chances, hoping the opponent forgets to block. Alright, GG's. So, good to see some interesting interactions with Spellbinder also growing the Serpentine Curve. Would now be a 26-26. So, goes to show how large Serpentine Curve can really get in this deck. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the play with a decent hand. Wouldn't be able to play turn 1 Delver, unfortunately, but we do have specimens to find more lands to set a bargain into Serpentine Curve, maybe times 2. So hopefully it's a matchup where a large Serpentine is good enough. And against Mono Green, that could certainly be the case if we don't die in the meantime. Probably fine to take a turn off killing the pack leader to hunt for environmental sciences. And then next turn we can sciences plus maybe thirst. And then we'll kill the pack leader. Although now it's also tempting to just demonic bargain to set up a giant curve. But I would rather bargain for a second curve. And I'm not guaranteed a fourth land if I do. So I think the slightly slower approach might still be worthwhile. And then for now the pass token is doing a fine job on defense. And then next turn I can bargain plus Delver. And then we should be able to cast two enormous curves. Which red-green typically struggles with. Alrighty. I 
and get another curve left and play Delver. So Valar opponent could attack. Do we let them draw or do we jump? I guess I should just uh, jump now. Because I'm kind of expecting the pack leader to grow, plus they could always use ranger class in the future. Delver does not transform just yet. And hopefully our token here prevents any attacks. And next turn we can make another one. Alright. A nice reveal from the Delver. I think I'm going to hang on to Fading Hope even though I could main phase it. Get aggressive here. Also reasonable to leave the Insect Liberation on defense since it can still potentially trade for like a token or a pack leader, but this should be good enough. Keep Fading Hope as insurance. And yeah, this is definitely a matchup where a big Serpentine Curve shines. Goldspan Dragon, a little bit unexpected. But I guess that resolves, and then we can bounce it before it gets a chance to attack and make additional treasure. And then our opponent will still be forced to double chump. Plus I could hunt for specimens for necrotic fumes to present lethal here. Alright, sweet, on to the next one. Alright, we're on the play with a keepable hand, I think. Especially against a creature deck, being able to turn 3 Stormcaller with double thirst potentially. And then could deal myself 3 damage to cast a turn 1 consider. Or I could wait and just play tapped for now. Since we don't really have a turn 2 play lined up, might as well save myself some damage. Turn 1 Swamp into Shambling Gas uh, Sacrifice deck. Not an amazing matchup for us. A good matchup for Village Rites. And then... Finding a Dread Fugue at some point to take away powerful cards is also going to be important. But our opponent does have plenty of answers to our Large Serpentine token. Skyclave Shade, not a card you see very often, could be quite effective here. Applying early pressure, I think we still consider. And then I might want to go for Stormcaller into Village Rites to just draw four cards. Although at that point, maybe I'm better off bouncing the Shade so I'm not under too much pressure. If I'm gonna draw cards with a Stormcaller. Don't really need Swamp. Alright, Thirst could be okay. So, let's draw four. Okay. Plenty of cheap interaction, although no discard spells and no real threats of our own. Also missing a creature to go with the second village rights. Field of Ruin into Skullport Merchants. I'm not opposed to just casting a Kicked Thirst to take out Merchants. And then I might still want to play this on black, given how many black spells we have in hand and the Restoration making blue mana. It's a close call. That works. It's 
So we could see a Planeswalker here, which we can also technically remove with the Thirst. Like a Spider Queen. It's gonna be another Shambling Ghasts. And a Skyclave Shade. Alright. So, what's my plan here? Don't really want to thirst any of the opponent's creatures right now. Could Fading Hope the Skyclave Shade again. Might want to consider first, but then I have to take three of uh, Restoration, so I might just play this tapped and then pass. And then we'll bounce the Shade. And we get to scry into hopefully some good stuff. Demonic Bargain could get Serpentine Curve. It's probably fine. As it also powers up all future copies that we might draw. It's gonna be a kicked Skycliff Shade now. So I can bargain. And we sadly exiled two copies of Serpentine Curve, so there's only one left in the deck. And then probably find to Thirst uh, Five Powered Shade here. And then we can still consider. Opponent does have Field of Ruin, which can also enable the Landfall on Skyclave Shade. Opponents looking through our exile pile here to figure out what our deck is trying to accomplish. Uh, they can replay the shade. Now we do have necrotic fumes in the sideboard to exile it, so if we can find a hunt for specimens, we can exile the shade for good. And another bargain, I'm probably going to have to put in the graveyard here since starting to run out of cards. Alright, so I can play a huge Serpentine Curve and then at the very least keep up Village Rites if they kill it. Probably hang on to Awakening as a spell in case we draw a couple Delvers. There's also Seagate Stormcaller, I could potentially combo with it. Like, I could even Awakening for two, get back Stormcaller, and then draw four with Village Rites again. But I don't think that's the move here. So let's Serpentine Curve, and then probably leave a blue in case I draw into another Fading Hope with the Village Rites. And then hang on to Awakening. So ideally, they can't remove the curve but might be an Infernal Grasp here, end of turn. Yeah, let's draw two, I guess. So, it's not looking great. Next turn I could make the play I described of Awakening back Stormcaller, and then double the Bloodchief's Thirst to kill a Ghast and a Shade. Although now I'm more interested in just killing Sorin. Sorin pluses. So we can kick Thirst on Sorin. And then... I guess I'm forced to Thirst to Shade, but they can still replay it pretty easily here. So yeah, not loving this. But we gotta shut off the card advantage. And we gotta avoid dying, so not much of a choice. Ended up flooding a little bit in the end. This could have been an okay spot to just cast to see get restoration to draw. So whereas against a deck like Mono Green or huge Serpentine token is difficult for the point to remove. Of course, Mono Black is not really gonna have any problems dealing with it. 
And yeah, I guess we just ended up drawing a few too many lands. Can cast Awakening for two just to get back a Stormcaller as a chum blocker, but that's not where we wanted to end up. And at this point, I can't really imagine a sequence that uh, still saves us, because I'll have to chump, go down to two, so even if I make another huge serpentine curve, the opponent can just attack with Shambling Ghast for the win. Skullport can sacrifice Shambling Ghast to shrink down Stormcaller and attack for the win. Alright, GG's. Skycliff Shade put in a lot of work, not a card you typically see out of these mono black decks, but uh, it was certainly effective. Failing to draw our uh, Hunt for Specimens to exile it. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the play with a double Delver opening. Yeah, I mean, this could work out. We even have a discard spell we can pair with Delver on turn 2 to maybe take away early interaction. And then we're on the play, so Delver's gonna apply a lot of pressure early. So if they have a 1-mana removal spell, that's unfortunate here. If they don't, they're gonna be in trouble. Alright, so let's play this untapped. Check out their hands. Take away their 1 removal spell. Now they still have Divide by Zero to bounce Delver back. But I'm happy to slow down their early interaction. Get to transform both Delvers. And attack for six. Probably no point in casting Hunt for Specimens when the opponent has a negate. Alright, never mind. Opponent drew the Fading Hope. So in that case we can replay Delver and Hunt for Specimens. And then this seems like a great spot to get Teachings. As we're almost empty-handed. And the reason Delver, of course, is so threatening in our deck is because we're very likely to transform it, unlike some other Delver builds out there. Opponent digging for interaction here. And we get to smash for seven. Can hang on to Awakening to actually get back a Delver if it gets killed. Draw three, and a Serpentine Curve will be another follow-up threat. Can always Fading Hope our own Delver to save it from a Sweeper. Right, rebuke. I guess I'm fine bouncing here. And then if they negate, that's also fine, then we can resolve Serpentine Curve. Another Curve, while it's not bad, it's not the same without the Demonic Bargain, so I'm probably still bottoming here. Would rather find more discard spells, or maybe another Hunt for Specimens. All right, step one, attack. And then knowing about the negates makes me less inclined to want to cast Serpentine Curve here. So I can just replay Delver. And then probably hang on to Restoration in case the game drags on. Yeah, I don't think I want to let my opponent spend their mana efficiently on negate here. So they can divide by zero the Aberration, and hopefully if the other Delver transforms we can put them to one. 
And then we can actually resolve Serpentine Curve. Alright, there we go. So these uh, Mythic Rare lands are doing a lot of work letting us transform Delver. Now our opponent will be able to take an extra turn and make two tokens, which do a pretty good job of blocking Aberration. But that being said, still liking our position overall. Now it would be really unfortunate if our opponent has uh, burns the house down to deal 5 to everything, with our token just uh, barely dying to it. Opponent actually goes for sciences instead of taking an extra turn. That's surprising. What's their plan here? Maybe copy a bounce spell? Nope. I guess they might have missequenced here and they wanted to take an extra turn first. Or maybe they were missing the untapped lands, is that possible? Yeah, I guess they only had a Hall of the Storm Giants in hand, so they couldn't actually cast the Epiphany yet. Alright, sweet. So yeah, we faced off against pretty much all the Tier 1 decks in Standard right now. Mono White aggro, Mono Green aggro, the Mono Black Sacrifice deck, even though it was a slight variant, and then Blue Red Epiphany, and then Red Green Werewolves as kind of a bonus match. And overall, while we didn't crush it by any means, we still got to see some awesome synergies in action, especially the Bargain into Serpentine Curve, great against any green decks that struggle to deal with a 14-14 token. Now our game against Mono White ended up being pretty close, and I think it was quite representative of the matchup, with the early disruption from Thalia and Elite Spellbinder being quite annoying for us to deal with, and we even got lucky to dodge a Brutal Cathar exiling our Serpentine Curve token, which can be quite backbreaking. although on the other hand, Skyclave Apparition at least cannot exile creature tokens, so we're safe there. But it is a matchup that could easily be improved in a best of three setting, for instance, where we get access to Parasitic Grasp, dealing three damage and gaining three life against humans, as well as potential sideboard cards like Crippling Fear as a nice sweeper. We could also search up with our Dark Bargain. And speaking of sideboards, in a best of three setting we could also play more discard spells like Duress, which shine against the control decks and epiphany decks in the format, especially nice with a Seagate Stormcaller being able to cast it twice, so this might actually be a better best of three deck than a best of one deck, but still a pretty fun time, and if you got some late demonic bargains in draft you could give this a shot, even though it's not going to be the tier one competitive deck you're looking for. So that'll do it for today's gameplay, wanna thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.